Hello, and welcome to my short documentary in unison with Campanile Wildlife Centre. Over the past few months, I have been researching, studying, and documenting the behaviours of the animals found in the collection, spending most of my time specifically researching on the trio of European brown bears called Maya, Brum, and Brummer. Over the years, zoos have been slowly changing their objectives inside the, their organisations, from general entertainment for the public, and instead have aimed towards more of an educational role, whilst also researching their species and the conservation of animals inside and outside of their own collections. In the past, animal regulations simply stated, an animal should at least have sufficient freedom of movement to be able to, without difficulty, turn round, groom itself, get up, lie down and stretch its limbs, as stated by Dr Bramble. These were designated as the five freedoms and have since evolved and developed, and now act as the foundation of animal legislation to this day. As of today, the five freedoms are freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury or disease, freedom to express natural behaviours, and freedom from fear and discomfort. These five points have become the official baseline for all legislation regarding zoos and their care for animals. Most notably is the Zoo Licensing Act of 1981, which states that it is unlawful for zoos to operate unless they have been given a license to do so by the local authorities, in this case being Dundee City Council, and they must follow the regulations when it comes to conservation measures being implemented. Failure to follow these rules and regulations may lead to the removal of their zoo license, rendering them unable to open and operate as a zoological collection. The original zoo license gained is valid for four years after receiving it. At this point, a new one must be applied for. Another notable piece of the legislation zoos must follow is the Animal Welfare Act of 2006, which states that there must be a person responsible for an animal on either permanent or a temporary basis. This in turn means they can commit an offence if care of an animal is not properly carried out, which may lead to potential fines and even jail times for the individuals and the collection may in fact lose their zoo licence. Zoos also have the option to request membership to a few different government organisations. One of these organisations is BIAZA, which is the British and Irish Association for Zoos and Aquariums which represents the best British and Irish zoos and aquariums. Being a Biazza supported zoo means you gain several benefits, such as being able to have shared resources, knowledge and expertise with other Biazza founded members. There is also EASA, which is the European equivalent of Biazza and is available to all zoos across Europe. There are many different indicators which show good and bad animal welfare standards. One of the indicators of good welfare standards is the animal being given a sufficient and nutritional diet that fully meets their needs and any alternative needs they require for things like health issues. On the flip side, not providing adequate diets for the animals can lead to severe health issues arising in the animal. Another form of good welfare standards is the collection being able to meet the animal's needs in terms of enclosure size and general layout for what the species requires. On the opposite side of this, not meeting the animal's needs by, for example, not giving the bears a big enough space to be able to live a good quality life may lead to behavioural issues arising in the animal. Daily, keepers must prepare food for their animals which meet their dietary and nutritional needs and provide it to the animal in a way which mimics their wild behaviours. They also must keep their enclosure in good condition. Both of these act as preventative healthcare measures and help prevent any potential diseases and health issues from arising in your animals. Whilst performing these duties, they are also checking for any changes in behaviour, such as issues with movement or eating food. These are required to be marked down and if deemed necessary, may require a vet check to check for any underlying issues that cannot be seen. They are also required to keep up to date records of all their animals and record any medication the animals are on and if there are any medical issues that come up with one of the animals during their time at the collection. ZIMS which is the Zoological Information Management System, 
is the main system used for keeping these records and can be accessed by zoo collections and is how information can be passed between zoos for things like feeding logs, behavioural observations, etc. which can be accessed by all keepers that use Zims. Zoos also use stud books alongside this. Stud books are used mainly for animal breeding and transferring between zoos. They allow for species to be matched appropriately and reduce the risk of inbreeding between animals by breeding animals from different collections rather than two from the same one. Alongside these, there is also the European Endangered Species Program. This is a program which aims to help species whose numbers have reached endangered status in the hopes that they have a healthy backup population in captivity, which is both genetically and demographically diverse. In the wild, European brown bears usually will eat a mixture of different fruits with meat and protein as a smaller amount of their diet, eating things such as hare and deer. Bears spend about 16 hours on average daily looking for food and feeding, which in turn makes up much of their daily activities. In the summer and autumn months before hibernation, their total calorie intake can reach up to 20,000 in a day in preparation. They obtain their food in a multitude of different ways. For example, they will normally forage milk for fruits and nuts, with them hunting for smaller animals at the same time to give them a wider range of available food sources. At Camperdown, the bears are on a diet of fruits, being apples, pears and plums, with nuts and meat. This diet allows them to have a natural diet, which meets all their natural dietary needs and fully mimics the behaviours they would show in the wild. For the fruit and nuts, the food is scattered around their outdoor enclosure to mimic how they would have to forage for food in the wild instead of having the food be handed to them. For the meat, it's given to them in different ways depending on the situation. Sometimes it is hand given to them by the keepers, but sometimes larger bits can be placed around the enclosure to help them hunt. The smaller produce items, such as hares and rats, are presented in fall as by having them presented with everything there, including their fur, mimics their natural behaviour of having to strip down the animals to get to the meat, just as they would have to have done in the wild. The larger bits of meat, however, are prepared and usually broken down before being placed around the enclosure. By having it be broken down, it can institute a hunt and provide the bears with an enrichment activity if needed. Whilst other large animals may exhibit different reactions due to stress in captivity, such as weaving, bears exhibit behaviours that match their dietary habits. Being an omnivore, they may end up biting down on bars or inedible things as well as pounding their paws down whilst huffing about their enclosure, as well as potentially hitting on their glass in anger. This can be caused due to stress-related issues such as the change in temperature during the winter months. Zoo animals being hand-fed can, in the long run, affect their general behaviour in and around feed times, causing things such as trying to gain a human attention can occur which might limit their ability to interact and blend in with their own species. For example, Beryl the wild cat, having been hand-reared, means she tries to solicitate attention from visitors at the zoo. These behaviours would obviously not be seen naturally in the wild, and have come around solely from being hand-reared by humans from a kitten till she could fend for herself. Many different animals in zoos will exhibit uncharacteristic behaviours. These can include pacing, swaying and overplucking. These behaviours are very often non-functional. For example, pacing the perimeter of the enclosure has no benefit to the animal and is solely done because of things like stress or boredom. But sometimes these can be done because of their natural tendencies, such as some herbivorous bird species, for example the kias, overplucking their feathers from an overindulgence of stress or in some instances if their enclosure doesn't meet their needs. 
Now, even though plucking is a natural behaviour for birds, the level of plucking can be deemed detrimental to the animal's well-being, and it's when it gets to this point that it is deemed uncharacteristic. In the case of the brown bears, their enclosure plays a major factor when it comes to their behaviours, as if their enclosure doesn't feel natural to them, it can affect their behaviours and may end up with them losing some of their more instinctive natural behaviours, such as hunting and general movement that they conduct. So by having their enclosure be more open and having the options for them to climb up things helps them be able to keep up and maintain their natural behaviours. The way the bear's food is prepared also helps keep their natural behaviours. As for their meat, it's not prepared very much, as by keeping their food, such as rabbits whole, means they will have to go about eating more naturally by having to remove a skin and fur from their food. And for their fruits, by having them scattered about the enclosure, it forces them to forage and hunt about for their food as opposed to being handed directly to them. A set of eviograms were taken of the bears before and after our chosen enrichment devices were placed into their enclosures. The following ethogram shows the data collected before the enrichment pro projects were placed into their enclosure. The ethograms taken in the weeks before the enrichment devices were placed show the bears resting and foraging around for food in their enclosure for most of the time, with occasionally playtimes and swimming involved randomly. This, however, could simply be explained since the bears were still fresh out of their torpor, so they might have still been getting their energy back to what it should be regularly. The enclosure provided for the bear is still a large enclosure in the centre, and with that comes the likelihood that it has many of the necessary requirements for this species already implemented. They have an indoor space, which is big enough for all three bears to be in, also with the option of being able to separate them if needed for things like feeds and checkups. The size and layout of the enclosure allows the bears to have enough room to fully be able to thrive and act naturally. The constructed platforms and walkway act as enrichment for them, allowing food to be placed up there and meaning they have to go up to get it rather than it being placed on the ground for them. The grass area, trees, logs and stones helps create a natural looking and feeling enclosure for the bears, which also aids them in acting naturally rather than superficially. The bears receive regular health checks since they are quite susceptible to things like tooth diseases, and some bears in the past have had issues with arthritis. So the indoor area allows for visual checks to be taken by keepers and vets alike, by having the bears trained to present to different parts of their body towards the gates, allowing for a better look in at it parts of interest. Finally, the bears have plenty of access to both food and water. Food is provided to them every few hours and consists of a mix of fruits, veg and meat, such as apples and pears for vegetation and rabbit for their meat. They also have a filtered water system for the bears pool, which doubles as a water source for them, as well as an area of play and enrichment. Overall, the bears have one of the best and most natural feeling enclosures of any animal there. The keepers do a fantastic job of keeping up to date with the welfare conditions, whilst also continuing to provide more and more in terms of enrichment and naturality for the bears themselves. For example, providing the bears with a different smell, in this case cinnamon, in places around the enclosure as a change of environment and to see how they react to the change for plans in the future. The chosen enrichment plans me and my group decided to implement into the bear's enclosure was a series of ice pulp-like items. 
These included frozen fruits such as apples, pears and blueberries being frozen in water and diluted juice, with a few melons also being frozen in addition to these blocks. The main objective of this enrichment, and what we were hoping to see from the bears, was them to become a touch more active, as at most times they seem rather lethargic and restive, so the aim was to see them hunt for their enrichment and become more active. The post-enrichment ethograms tell a pretty simple story. The bear spent the entire time looking for their placed ice poles and frozen melons, then eating them. This was expected as the outcome, and these ethograms helped us to be able to capture these results accurately. The enrichment itself went well. The making of it and implementing it all went smoothly, and the bears looked like they really enjoyed it. I believe the only minor change I would make to the enrichment is potentially the placement of some of the ice poles, or even making more of them to have spread out even further across the enclosure to, for the bears to have more available.